Welcome to Civilization 6. Today, we will be watching and laughing at our idiot player as he attempts to play this game. While setting up the game, he spends a very long time picking who to play as. Seriously dude, just pick one. He eventually settles on Suleiman of the Ottomans because he hasn't played them before. He also chooses Emperor for difficulty. For those not familiar with the difficulty levels in Civ, it works like this. The Civ AI is dumb as a bag of hammers. When you change the difficulty you are doing nothing to affect how the AI plays only how much it cheats. King is a little cheating. Emperor is a lot of cheating. Immortal is a crap load of cheating. And Deity is for people that hate themselves but don't own a whip, so they have to settle for digital self-flagellation. Ah fledgling Istanbul, settled on the fertile flutelands of the Murar River. You are in for some stuff, son. This game starts off the way most Civ games do. Poking around a bit. Whoa, look at that. So pretty. Is that a volcano? Let's move away just in case it erupts in the next few turns. You have got to be kidding me. Subjugating the barbarian hordes. I am sure they did something to deserve this. Making some stuff. Moron avoids trying to build any early wonders as the cheating AI always snakes them. Instead he focuses entirely on infrastructure. His national defense plan is to pray really hard that no one attacks him. I'm sure that won't come back to bite him later. Meeting the people that will be your headache for the next 6 to 8 hours. First up is Horse Girl to the Northwest. Dinwit tries to be her friend, even though he knows he will always be number 3 in her life after her horse and daddy's money. She is surprisingly receptive. Next up is a giant baby man to the east. He wants to be friends too. Lastly, we have the mustache twirling villain of this story. And what a mustache it is. I hate his stupid face already. He is to the southwest. Also, some guy shows up on a dog sled with Tim Hortons. The Ottomans are in a tight spot. They are surrounded on three sides by other powers with the sea to the north. Any expansion will need to be done quickly or it won't happen at all. They grab some open land near Horse Girl, but Baby Man takes the best spots to the east. How you gone to us like that Baby Man? Dummy also forward settles on the Russians in the last available good spot to the south. That is a bold move for a man with only two units of archers. Our intrepid retard pauses to consider his options now that further expansion is not possible. War seems the only viable option, but the Ottomans have an ability that is very good for war. Great Turkish bombard means that captured cities lose no population. It also has some benefits to siege engines. Snidely Whiplash is the best target as all the other neighbors are good chums. Dingus needs to build up an army, but first he builds a couple of encampments to aid in it, as well as to provide some defenses if the Russians attack first. This proves fortuitous as Snidely clearly believes the old adage, do unto others before they do unto you. The Ottomans are able to hold off the Russian vanguard units, but they know that once the bulk of the army arrives they are in trouble. Nimrod makes the smartest move for his situation. Suleiman, the tidal wave of horse flesh washes over the Russian heartland, disrupting the Russian reinforcements and causing havoc, giving the Ottomans the time they need to build a small army and take their first city. Snidely manages to broker a peace deal from Horse Girl, but at that point the damage is done. The Ottoman army presses their advantage and moves on to the next city, but are thrown back by a powerful new Russian invention. Walls. How diabolical. The Ottomans divert south in search of softer targets, but they run straight into the next wave of Russians and begin taking losses. Who would have thought that invading Russia would be difficult? The Ottoman survivors retreat to their first prize to regroup. While they do this, Snidely petitions the World Congress to declare an emergency to retake their lost city. As if they weren't the aggressors here. Only Canada answers the call. Et to Canucks. And their contribution is minimal given their distance in the intervening mountains. A steadily increasing supply of troops along with gradual upgrades allow the Ottomans to renew their assault and slowly grind their way to victory, despite the Russian cities being dug into the mountains like ticks. They capture two more before stalling at the Russian capital of St. Petersburg. It is here that Snidely unleashes his most terrifying weapon yet. The Cossack. This unit has a combat strength high enough to kill many of the Ottoman units in a single attack. Thankfully the Russians cannot seem to build very many, likely due to a limited supply of horses. The Cossacks are defeated at great cost, and St. Petersburg falls to newly arrived Ottoman bombard cannons. How very Turkish. 
At this point, it is all over but the crying. The Ottoman army rolls back to the east and takes Moscow before finally demanding peace from Snidely, who capitulates. While Dumbass was tempted to wipe out the Russians entirely, their two remaining cities were low value, far from the capital, and would have a wide border with Canada. Stopping here makes the Ottoman gains much easier to defend. By the end, the long war had lasted 1,935 years. Oh my. Now that the war was over, their borders were secure, and their lands were vast, the Ottomans needed to figure out what the hell to do with themselves. Specifically, how to win the game. Numskull evaluated his options. He was way behind on culture so that victory condition was out. Everybody but his two buddies hate him for warmongering so diplomatic victory was not feasible. Science victory seemed the way to go, since he was already invested in science as a way to get an edge in the war. More campuses are constructed as are industrial districts in an effort to get ahead on infrastructure. Commercial districts are built to take advantage of the Ottoman unique building, the Grand Bazaar, and to allow more trade routes to their allies. The Ottomans enjoy a very long period of peace that is uninterrupted aside from some Russian and Canadian saber rattling. They also get out and finally explore the rest of the world. They meet Buffett Destroyer, Cranky Ginger, and know the spear is not a phallic symbol lady. The Russians have apparently been talking smack so the Ottomans are already hated by everyone. Snidely, you chatty bitch. The Ottoman economy is a runaway freight train right up until their newer buildings start needing power. That is fine, where the coal at? None? Not a single deposit in the whole country? Fine, they will just grin and bear it until oil is revealed. Wait, no oil either? Ridiculous. Well, there is one spot on this remote useless island. Desperate times call for desperate measures. At least there was some damn uranium. Eventually the whole country is powered. Nitwit manages to actually build several wonders, but the most important of these is the Great Zimbabwe, which gives a bonus to every trade route departing from its city. It is built in Arkhangelsk, the first city captured from the Russians, and every trade route in the country originates there. Long story short, the Sultan now has a giant Scrooge McDuckian vault full of cash to swim around in. Around the time the Ottomans kick off the space race, Arkhangelsk is eclipsed Istanbul in both size and productive output. By combining multiple bonuses from government policies, great people, and governors, Airhead manages to put a satellite into orbit, land on the moon, land on Mars, and launch an exoplanet colony mission in less than 40 turns. Not bad. At this point the game is basically won, and the Ottomans just need to faff about for 50 turns until the colony ship arrives, and the victory cinematic plays as no other civilizations are anywhere close to winning. As Ignoramus contemplates what his victory lap will look like, a coalition of jerks consisting of Buffett Destroyer and Cranky Ginger declare war. Buffett Destroyer's invasion force is destroyed at sea, and the Ottomans capture her oil town, just in time for them to no longer really need oil. How is the Ottoman oil town doing? Yet, still a frozen hellhole. Cranky Ginger's contribution to the war consists entirely of thoughts and prayers. In bird culture, this is considered a dick move. With that war in the bag, how he gone flex on these chumps next? Giant death robots. It is time to pop the butt pimple that is snidely once and for all. The Canadians do not take kindly to this and declare war. All they really accomplish is acting as a nuclear weapons test target. Enjoy your radioactive maple syrup, you sassy boy. For the first time ever, Harse Girl and Baby Man fail to renew their friendship with the Ottomans. Why remains a mystery, but we are all very sad. A few more turns tick by, and in 1929, the exoplanet colony ship arrives and the game ends. How did Doofus stack up? Catherine the Great, because apparently we have not had enough horse girl jokes in this story. Anyway, that is how you play Civilization VI like adult.